So apparently this was quite a mission, almost like something out of Mission Impossible. A special response Air Force team was instantly dispatched to Utah. They had to pick up this very important cargo really fast. The Osiris Rex capsule that luckily landed in the most convenient location, basically right next to a road. And within just approximately half an hour, it was quickly checked for damage, analyzed for potential hazards, photographed for posterity, packed for transport, and sent away on an Air Force helicopter. This was probably the most efficient rescue mission of the last few years. And within just a few hours, the capsule already arrived to its destination, opened up and analyzed for potential damage, making sure that nothing was contaminated, and placed in one of the funky clean rooms where it's going to be stored now in order to basically retrieve all of the samples, with all of this collected from the asteroid panel back in October of 2020. And so, hello wonderful person, this is Anton. Let's briefly discuss this recent announcement and I guess a recent accomplishment by NASA of one of the most important and most successful sample return missions ever attempted that began a few years back with the launch of the OSIRIS-REx craft that explored this beautiful asteroid a while back. Although here, except for the success of the mission, at the moment there's really not much else to say. Although considering the fact that this capsule has been making its way home for over three years now, since 2020, this is a pretty big achievement. But because the capsule has only been recently retrieved, and because the actual samples are still inside, protected from the elements, we're not going to know much more about what's happening here until approximately October 11th. That's when some of the preliminary data and some of the preliminary results are going to come out. But we still have some stuff to talk about here, especially in regards to what's going to happen in the next few years, and most importantly, looking back at the history of these incredible sample return missions. Although first of all, out of all previous missions, this one so far has been the most successful in terms of the actual landing. Apparently, it just really nicely landed on the surface, didn't roll, didn't bounce, didn't move anywhere, and was literally right next to the road. Which is exactly why the retrieval was so successful and so quick. And that's in comparison to some of the previous missions, where things didn't go as planned. And so here it's actually important to touch a little bit on the history of these missions, because this is obviously not the first. This has now been done for over two decades with some of the first robotic spacecraft visiting various locations, essentially starting back in the late 90s. Now, one of the first and I guess most exciting missions was the NASA's Stardust, launched in 1999, with the main purpose being the comet known as WILD-2, approximately 5 kilometers in size, and a comet from which quite a lot of different samples were collected by flying through its coma. In this case, this mission used this gel that you see right here, in order to capture a lot of different particles. Although here it also captured quite a lot of interplanetary dust. And the first analysis that came out of this mission basically taught us quite a lot about comets. There were quite a lot of organic compounds, quite a lot of biologically usable nitrogen, and even the previous presence of liquid water based on presence of certain minerals, such as copper sulfides, that can only form in the presence of water. And this basically suggested that some comets get really warm and do acquire liquid water somewhere inside. Their ice melts temporarily, potentially stirring a lot of chemistry inside. But some other discoveries were a little bit more surprising. A lot of these materials must have been formed in relatively hot environments at approximately 1000 Kelvin. Basically suggesting that this comet must have been formed in a very hot protoplanetary disk four and a half billion years ago. So definitely a lot of unique discoveries, and some of the first important data coming from various interplanetary bodies. But roughly around the same time, there was another important mission from a different space agency, JAXA, the Japanese space agency. They launched a mission to a very unusual asteroid, the first mission to an asteroid, the asteroid known as Itakawa. We didn't really know much about it at first, but it was pretty quickly discovered to be some kind of a very long object consisting of two different asteroids that most likely joined over time. These unusual bilobal asteroids are pretty common in the solar system. It starts as a binary system that starts to spin faster and faster, and at some point two objects become one. A kind of a space love story. Or the really a result of sunlight and the pressure from the sun. And so in this case, this mission was able to collect quite a lot of dust particles from the asteroid surface back in 2005. 
And for the Japanese space agency, at that time this was the most complex such mission. Very impressive, and something that took NASA at least a decade more to try to develop. Here they literally picked up some of the samples from the surface. But because the samples were quite tiny, and quite a lot of them were somewhat difficult to study, other than the actual physical analysis and the analysis of density and surface properties, some of the analysis revealed different types of water on the surface, different types of isotopes of water. Some must have been formed by the sun and the interaction with the solar wind, but some could have come from a different source. Either way though, this asteroid seems to be quite enriched in water. And since there was also a discovery of different organic compounds, and also very important minerals such as olivine, in some sense it did suggest that some of the water on planet Earth must have come from these asteroids that essentially had their water formed by the sun itself. Or just to rephrase this, the interaction of the solar wind with various asteroids that then crash on the surface of planet Earth could be the actual origin of some water on planet Earth. Once again, around the same time, there was another NASA mission, this time called Genesis. And here it was supposed to capture a lot of solar wind particles and interstellar gas. But this happened. These samples were basically lost. Luckily not all of them, but for the most part the data from this mission, even today, is not particularly useful. In this case this was a problem with the parachute, but NASA learned quite a lot from this mission and from this failure, with many lessons applied to the mission we have now. And then, one of the most recent and most exciting missions was by the Japanese agency. This time, asteroid Ryugu. One of the more intriguing asteroids near us, surprisingly very similar to Bano in appearance. I mean, just check this out. This is Bano, this is Ryugu. Bano, Ryugu. Although Ryugu is approximately double in size. And up until recently, this was the most complicated mission ever attempted, resulting in one of the most successful sample retrievals and successfully achieved by any space organization in the world. As you can see from this animation, it basically involved creating a small crater and a very delicate landing picking up just enough rocks to be analyzed for later on. And this mission officially finished back in 2020. By December of 2020, it returned the samples to planet Earth, with many of them already analyzed, it also provided some of the most advanced results. For example, once again, it was determined that all of this was formed in high temperatures, very likely above 1000 degrees Celsius, potentially closer to the sun or in very hot conditions inside the protoplanetary disk. It was also determined that this asteroid was most likely a breakaway from a larger parent body, very likely a result of a major collision. And that larger body that had a collision was most likely formed in some kind of a dark nebular gas possibly in the outskirts of the solar system before it was transported much closer. And this original parent body potentially existed after just 2 million years after the formation of the solar system, one of the first objects in existence. But over the next 3 million years, so basically 4.5 billion years ago, it was already pretty warm here. It must have been at least 50 degrees Celsius on the surface, which resulted in a lot of complex chemistry of a lot of different rocks with a lot of different ices. This is visible in different formations including hydrous silicates and because iron became magnetite, magnetic type of iron. All of this requires liquid water and certain temperatures on the surface. But this large parent body that was probably 100 or more kilometers in size was then collided by something maybe much smaller, 10 kilometers, with the overall impact speed of 5 kilometers per second with many different fragments produced in the process, one of them being Ryugu. Or they didn't form as an actual rock. Just like with many other similar asteroids, it was essentially a rubble that slowly coalesced into a larger object. And we know this for a fact because of similar observations from Bennu as well. We even have a video showing us what happened. When Osiris Rex was trying to retrieve the samples from Bennu, even though the surface here was expected to be a little bit harder, it turned out to be basically rubble that the probe sort of sank through. You can actually see it happening right here. It literally enters the asteroid as if it's basically made out of dust. And that's kind of what all of these asteroids are like. They're not really rocks. They're just a kind of a collection of rubble from previous collisions that through gravity accumulate into one single object that then orbits around the solar system. And so many simulations that we see where they're presented as rocks are basically wrong. 
But going back to Ryugu and going back to the Hayabusa 2 mission, here the chemical analysis also revealed huge amounts of titanium, chromium, molybdenum, and most importantly, a relatively large content of water. This asteroid is approximately 7% by weight, water. And more intriguingly, one of the unusual crystals here literally contained carbonated liquid water sample inside of it, with that water containing various salts and various organic matter. And this incredible discovery of liquid water was made inside an unusual hexagonal iron sulfide crystal that then very likely mixed with carbon dioxide in order to produce this carbonated liquid water. So yeah, for the lack of better words, we sort of found soda in outer space, inside a crystal, inside an ancient asteroid. But this is obviously a really important discovery in order to learn more about the evolution of life and the evolution of organic biology across the solar system. And even stranger than that, very recently, just I guess a few months ago, scientists also found super important organic molecules, uracil and vitamin B3, locked away in one of the samples. Which by itself is a huge deal. It basically once again confirms that, technically, everything we're made out of and everything that produces life can and does exist in outer space in many different asteroids, can and usually does get delivered to various planets through collisions, and probably, sometimes, produces complex life. And all of this was learned from just one asteroid with a relatively small sample collected three years ago. But the sample from Bano is so much more exciting. With one reason being the fact that it's way bigger, in terms of mass, something like 50 times heavier. NASA was able to collect 250 grams, enough to analyze this for decades to come. And so even though at least one-fourth of all of the samples here will be used in experiments and analysis, as well as sent to different countries like Canada and Japan, the vast majority of the sample is actually going to be stored for the future generation to be analyzed decades later. Not because we don't want to analyze it now, but mostly because some of the technology that we need to analyze it just doesn't exist yet. Which is actually why some of the previous samples collected two decades ago are still being analyzed today as well. And so even though 5 grams from asteroid Ryugu was super exciting, 250 grams from asteroid Bano is just on a completely different level. And since the samples from Ryugu, as I just mentioned, contained components of RNA, I honestly cannot wait to find out what sort of incredible stuff this asteroid was hiding as well. Although, fun fact, there's a tiny tiny chance that more of this asteroid is going to be delivered to Earth in the next few thousand years. Yeah, not in the way that you think though. Uh, this way. Bannon is one of the potentially hazardous asteroids that has something like 0.05% chance of collision with our planet in the next 300 to 400 years. So yeah, more samples coming eventually. Although technically now we know how to redirect asteroids, and you can learn more about this in one of the videos in the description, so maybe not that big of a deal. But this is still super exciting times for many different scientists trying to learn more about the history and the evolution of solar system, but also for various biological scientists trying to figure out how life started here and if it can actually exist somewhere else. We just need some time to analyze the samples and to figure everything out. We'll probably get some first answers in a couple of weeks from now, but until then, thank you for watching, subscribe, check out some of the previous videos in the description below, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying a wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.